The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. This podcast is proudly brought to you by 360 Health. MetLife's award-winning end-to-end health program designed to help your clients defend against serious health conditions so they can live healthier for longer. MetLife's 360 Health provides quick, easy and discreet access to over 50,000 leading local and global specialists, including general practitioners, doctors, psychologists, specialists and mental health clinicians. Talk to a MetLife sales manager today to find out more about how you and your clients can access expert medical support and guidance from the comfort of your own home. All right, welcome back to the podcast. I'm James Wrigley. Uh, thank you for joining me today. I have the pre- the pleasure, rather, of speaking with Barry Lavalley. Barry, I've, I've had the opportunity to speak with you before. Years and years and years ago, I'm, I'm sure I came across you at a presentation or something, probably in person in Melbourne. But Barry, thank you for joining me. You're not in Melbourne right now. Maybe where where are you? And, and thanks for joining us. Uh, I am on the west coast of, of uh, Canada, um, actually the east coast of Vancouver Island, just north of Victoria. Yeah. And uh, it is uh, it's not the beginning of spring, but uh, as as it is the beginning of fall there, it uh, feels very much like winter. Yeah, still, and we were, we were chatting off uh, before we pressed record that uh, so I'm in the city in Melbourne today, and uh, it's all of a sudden turned. We've had a pretty warm end to summer, but um, quite co- getting quite cool already now, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. So, so Barry, I guess, tell us a little, a little bit about yourself, the type of work that you do. Um, you know, I, I've come across you kind of retirement planning type, type of work, but maybe for anyone that doesn't know who you are, can you fill us in a little bit? Well... I, I've been in the financial services industry since 1980, I guess. So it's it's going on a long time. I I was an advisor. I was a senior mutual funds executive. Um, and I, about 1997, decided to go up on my own. Now, I have a psychology background. And one of the things I was interested in was the aging process, not just for the client's uh, you know, you had the aging boomers who were still in their middle age or, you know, younger to middle age you know, back in 97. But we were all getting older and I was very much interested in what do we go through as we get older? How does that affect the way we look at our money? But more important, how does it affect the way we look at our lives? Huh. And I began to lecture on that to uh, organizations. Uh, I had a lot of contacts in the financial services industry in Canada and the United States. And I talked a lot about dealing with an aging clientele. I uh, I taught a couple of the university degree programs in aging, uh, but not necessarily the financial. But then I used that knowledge to expand into the financial services industry. So I focus on two things. I focus on communicating with an aging clientele. And of course, my market there, because of my contacts, are businesses in the financial services industry. And the second one is speaking to clients about retirement, but not the financial. There's lots of seminars and books on the financial. It's the non-financial. What do you go through as you enter into this phase of your life? And What issues do people face and how do they look at money differently than financial advisors look at it? And so I produced a very popular seminar that I deliver globally to select groups to talk to their clients about what you go through as you age, things you maybe should know but didn't, and how should that affect the decision making you make on your life path, but also on the finances that are going to fund it. So that, in a nutshell, is how I got to this point. This is about my seventh trip to Oz, and yeah. I am so excited every time I get a chance to come down and visit 
And uh, I keep getting asked back, so I assume that the message is every bit as relevant now as it was 10 or 15 years ago when I started this. So when, so when you first started it, was, was it just, was it your experience as an advisor and dealing with clients that had gone through the aging that kind of formed the foundation of it to begin with? Or was there some university studies or, you know, was, was it, where, like, where did you get that material from? It was always my intention to focus on this area. And I was an early researcher because I thought the thing, the value that I was going to have originally as an advisor was being able to understand clients. Uh, you never did that. When I was an investment advisor, say in the mid 80s, it was all about money. And for most advisors, it's still all about money. <laughs> But I thought, okay, I got to do something different and carve out a niche for myself that I was doing the only kind of, of, of presentations, et cetera, that uh, uh, in this nature uh, and anybody else who was doing it was an academic who wasn't focused on the people that have the relationships with aging clients and their money. And that was the financial advisor. So that's how it all started. Um, I... Uh, uh, went back at it to my university education, uh, and then it was all application, applying it to different situations, working with different advisors, coaching them, but also working with individual clients. So it kind of all came together at once. And so if you published a, you've published a book on the topic, I, haven't I've you? got a couple of books. Uh, yeah. I've got a book for advisors called The Life First Advisor that's yeah. based on the premise that Financial advice is based on an understanding of life issues and how can I turn financial advisors into life coaches? Uh, and then the second book was called So You Think You're Ready to Retire, and it focused on the end user, on the client, and it was based on two premises uh, or two uh, uh, issues. It's did you know dot, 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 or have you thought about dot, dot, dot. And it's really designed to be read in conjunction with your discussions with your financial advisor. Gotcha. Yep. And so you're, co you're coming out to Australia shortly to host, I imagine, a, a series of presentations. Is that yeah? That, that, I, that's I with, a, with an existing financial planning group? It's not. Is it something that uh, you know I could go along to? Um, I, I'm working with one financial group to do a three city tour of of Brizzy, um, uh, Melbourne, and Sydney. Yep. Um, and uh, then working with the individual clients of a number of, of, of firms, um, you know, I'm going to speak in Mackay, I'm going to speak in Dubbo, uh, Brisbane, Melbourne, uh, Sydney, uh, Hawke's Bay, and uh, Christchurch. Um, so I'm going to get around. I, I, I've got a number of different presentations, and I also have a, a, a presenting at a conference for one of the biggest asset providers in, in Australia, a um, firm called Dimensional Fund Advisors. Ah, oh, yes. Yeah. I'm speaking at their conference, uh, working with advisors, talking about uh, two or three different topics, but one is how do you communicate with an aging client? Yeah, right. Yep. So, so it's a mixed bag. It's three weeks. Can you, oh, that's, a, that's a decent trip. Can, can you maybe share, for anyone that's listening, can you maybe share... It's like some of what that what that involves. So, as you said, I, I imagine you know, there's there's probably a lot of financial advisors that they come into the office and they put up on the board the this is your numbers and this is how it's going and you're up or you're down. But but how do we broaden that conversation? Like what 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 are what's the message? What what are some of the good advisors doing in that space? I like to think that the hallmark of a good advisor is to act more as a coach than as an advisor because the older that we get. The, the more we need somebody to help us clarify the key issues that we need to think about and then give us their insight based on an understanding of us as an individual, but also of, of the financial implications, and then work with us in a sense of partnership so that I feel, for example, that my advisor gets me, understands me, asks me the right questions. Because a lot of coaching is getting me to uncover my own issues and then guiding me to the decisions that I ought to make. That's a different approach than what most financial advisors do. So that's that's really it in a nutshell. Yeah. 
are there particular questions that you would that you would suggest people be asking advisors be asking their clients to dig that little bit deeper yeah I, the one question that most advisors will not ask is what is your purpose now okay. i'm a very big believer in a purpose driven life that we make our life decisions based on our overall purpose what do we want to be what do we want to represent what's the money for what's our life now that gets pretty heavy but as an advisor i would you know sit back with a client and say okay before we get into the finances and investment decisions etc let's talk a little bit about your purpose your purpose in your life areas your health your relationships your um uh your work right. all of these areas are, are the sum total of your life and i need to understand them not that i'm going to psychoanalyze you but i have to work with you to make the best financial decisions based on my understanding of you maybe more important based on your understanding of yourself does that make sense mm. it's a different approach to this it's not about money money is a tool money lets you have the life you want but most people simply look at money as a way to buy toys to get themselves security to get themselves independence but they don't really examine what that means in their life i just need to understand how you feel about these things so that you and i build a plan we're not going to miss anything yeah so that's that's really the approach that i take and that i teach got you okay we the, the last time that you and i spoke it would, would i was i asked you to to join me on on linkedin a, a few years ago it was right at the very start of covid and uh you were at home i was at home uh, and I was doing a bit of a series of just talking to people. It, it, turned, it turned out to be talking to people that were in different parts of the world about what was going on in in, in where they were. Do you, do you think do you think this like outlook on retirement and purpose and all the rest of it? Do you, do you have a sense that that might have changed for people in the last few years, given what we've I been through? I think that that uh, uh, a lot of people got to take what retirement might be like. At a different age than they would normally have, have gotten that taste. Um, let me explain. Um, when we were locked down with COVID, for a lot of people, even if they were still working or working from home, every day was like groundhog day. You didn't see the same number of people. You didn't go out as much. You know, you were working, but you were also then entertained by the telly, and and um, it was it was a strange life, wasn't it? Mm, it certainly was. For a lot of people who are retired, that also is the light. See, one of the keys to a successful retirement, having things to do, having purpose, having structure. If you live a life that is unstructured, most people tend to drift into, as I said, groundhog day. If you're going to have a, a, a fulfilling retirement, you've got to have things to do, places to go, keeping your head in the game. And, and that means living on purpose. It was the same with COVID. If we wanted to make the most out of the situation we were in, we had to intentionally create or do things given the circumstances we were facing. Retirement's a circumstance. It is either you not working anymore, changing where you work, and now all of a sudden you are in this different reality. You can go two ways. You can make it into what you want, which is what successful retirees do, but far too many people. I'm going to estimate 90% just exist. And the longer that they go, the more they just exist. And they get to the point where they stop trying to do new things. It's quite easy in retirement to nest. Hmm. And uh, I'm trying to stop people from nesting. Um, you want a good retirement, let's define what that means, hence your purpose. And then let's figure out in the different life areas you have how you're going to get that. And I'll figure out with you how to take the finances and wrap it around that that's yeah. retirement planning to me yeah yeah and and, and in my experience it's when you know, the the you know, I work with a lot of retired clients and and in my experience those as you pointed out those that have the most fulfilling retirement are the ones that are the busiest like there's one lady that comes to mind I, I, I see her every four months and she comes into the office here and we always make the next we organize. We always organize the next meeting at the end of the current one. So you know we've we've both got some expectation of when we're meeting up again. Um, 
trying to find a time with her in her diary four months out in advance, it's impossible because she has so much, so many different things on. And, and she's one that I often think about living in a, a really fulfilling and purpose-driven retirement in that she's just got so many things on the go. She's not sitting at home flicking channels on the TV, just passing the time. I'll bet you she doesn't even think about what she's doing in terms of filling in time. That's the way she lived life. That's the way she always lived life. And it's the financial advisor as a coach can simply ask questions about what people want out of a fulfilled life and how they can start making that happen even before they retire. So this idea that, okay, now you're retired, now let's find some things for you to do. That's the way we would plan a long weekend. And then pretty yeah. soon get tired of the long weekend and watch the telly. Yeah. Uh, I want people to think in terms of what it is like that's really important and to find things in life that are fulfilling, that make them feel like they have relevance. And uh, so, you know, the work that I do in teaching advisors is them how to ask the right questions, how to have discussions like you and I are having right now, and how to identify what is purpose in, in each of your life areas. And and then live to that. If you want to have a nap in the afternoon, go have a nap. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> but that's retirement and the freedom comes from you doing whatever it is you absolutely want. But here's the problem. Most people buy into that definition of retirement. It's freedom, your ability to do what you want, when you want, how you want. But people don't do it. They say, I can do this, but I, I, I'm i tired today. Or, ah, it's too much work. I'll do it next week. And then they never get to it. And pretty soon, they're just living the same life over and over and over. If it were just a few people, James, I would say, well, we can work with them and help them, but it is far more than a few people that treat retirement like that. Huh. So uh, that's where I think this approach is valuable. Have Have you given any thought to, yeah, if, as you said, if it was a few people, you could, you know, the advisors or the people in those, the people in the lives of that the retirees could you know, do some work on trying to get them out and about and doing some things. But is there, have, have you ever, I'm sure you probably have pondered, have, have you pondered how 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 you could address this or how we could address this like on on mass you know it's a theoretically a, a, a big problem a lot of people sitting at home doing not a whole lot how would we do it well it's a tough thing yeah. um you know, if somebody the book they'll read the book they get all excited and then they put it away that's if we could convince people that having a purposeful life actually is a, a programmed approach that if they act in this way, it's in their best interest. We're very big on adopting things if we can convince it's in our best interest. So if I'm your coach, if I'm your advisor coach, I'm going to share with you how I can get the best out of you to help me help you, but I'm also going to give you an approach yourself so that you can help yourself. So the difference between an advisor and coach, you as an advisor, not you as a any advisor who's an advisor is going to tell me what to do. The coach is somebody who helps me see it myself. And so if I can train a lot of advisors to take that approach, then I can get them to train their clients to take the same approach. Yeah, gotcha. Yep. Now, was it you? I, I think it might have been you that I that I heard this this phrase. Like it was you or you or someone, but it's along the same line of what we're talking about. Um, this idea of that, you know, we we go on holiday to take a break from our working life, but then when, but then when your but when your whole life is effectively a holiday, how, how do you take a break from the holiday? It, it's it's that what successful diaries is they take all of their activities and consider that part of their leisure plan, including work or work, what we would call work or workplace, but and so they don't look at work activities as having to gain a paycheck or something you hate on a Monday morning that you don't want to do. They are taught to look at work as something that actually is enjoyable leisure for them, which means you could be working into 80 or 90 or beyond. And I I expect that that most people, if they just get the fun out of the work that they do, they'll work it as um, So you might retire from your job at Woolworths or whatever, but 
um, uh, you know, you can find other things to do. You could go volunteer and really get involved in that. That's work. Or taking on a home project or going back to school. Um, you know, the University of the Third Age, an Australian <laughs> contribution, yes. uh, is, is overwhelmed with stuff. So, uh, you know, let's make life fun, uh, including the nap you sneak this afternoon. I wonder if it's a generational thing or maybe it's just a time in the workforce thing. But, I, you know, I, I personally do a lot of work with, with clients that are, you know, knocking on the door of retirement. They might be, you know, late 50s, early 60s, and, and they're often coming and saying, James, you know, I've got a few years worth of, of work ahead of me. You know, how, how do I make best of you know, the last few years of my, of my life and what I might have built up until this point to help support and fund retirement? And, and these, call them 60-something-year-olds, are looking towards the time when they don't want to work anymore. They want to stop completely and then life's, you know, c- complete leisure. But then at the other end, I do a lot of work with people that are often in their late 30s, early 40s. They've got the young families, mortgages, all of these kind of things. So it's a different type of financial advice that we're doing. But more often than not, the conversations I'm having with that type of person, they're aspiring to get to a point where they don't have to work anymore where they work because they want to or they enjoy it. They don't have to because they need the money. But I, I would say the the majority of people, and it may be just the type of person that I happen to be talking to, but the vast majority of those people, at least when they're in their early 40s, they say to me, we have no intention of actually completely stopping work. We'll, you know, we'll go to part-time. We'll, I don't know, we'll volunteer in the kids' canteen at school or something like that you know they'll they'll they all intend i say all probably three quarters of them all intend to continue to work in some paid gainful employment in some variety at least in their 40s and then maybe that changes when they're in their 60s but i find it i find it a difference between the 60 year old and the 40 year old I, do you have any insight do you have any idea of why that might be the case for all it was totally the, the training of a 60 year old to look at retirement has been totally botched by our industry. Yeah. We made it a financial situation. We said, if you get to 65, and um, if you make it in good health at 65, now you get the 30 years comes after. Yeah. yeah. And you can have a 30 year long weekend. And you love your weekend. I'll think about well, how good it's going to be. The work has always been set up as. Uh, something you did like it was something you had to do in order to make the paycheck to add to the pile that you were building up for the future. No, not yeah. everybody did that. A lot of didn't save for the future. Continued to uh, say they were going to work until they were a hundred. But for many people, you got your pension at the set time, and we were the benefit beneficiaries of uh, much, many much more uh, in the area of defined benefits plans as opposed to contributions. Um, so you had the income that was coming in and the whole idea was you were going to have a year in retirement. That sure. was the sixth one. That came from, you know, from, uh, insurance companies advertising on TV about insurance plans. It came from financial advisors telling us we had a company here that had the slogan of freedom 55. Um, you know, and now their plans are all 65, so they're reworking that, uh, we were trained to think about retirement as the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Yes. Uh, when you get to retirement, for most people, without a plan, without a purpose, that's not what retirement is. Retirement is just plain order. And it's uh, the people that, that get away from that boredom are those people that probably have always tried to do things on their own. But most people get to this point and they exist. Because the human human nature is that if we are doing something purposeful, we fall back into existing. Purposeful mm. means you live on purpose. You decide you're going to do something and you know why you're doing it. Uh, the rest, it's filling in time. So, you know, it's a different generation for a 40-year-old who is not tied into a lot of the retirement training that we were given. It's interesting, James. I find this around the world, too. Uh, North America. But, um, you know, I do work in Australia, England, um, India in the last couple of years or three years ago. And it's retirement is that way, too, there. So it's human nature. 
Yeah, it's 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 a it's a noticeable difference that I see in that you know there's a twenty year age gap between between the two generally, and the forty year old that's you know they're all they're, and, and they're all bought into you know whether it's social media, whether they're reading it in books, and, and often coming in saying, you know, I I need a passive income, I need another income stream, I need a passive income, but that we we dig into what that actually means for them and why and all the rest of it, but yeah, there's there seems to be a bit more. Purpose, and I said it might just be the type of clients, the forty-year-olds that are seeking out my advice. But it, it notes some difference. It's general. Uh, and, and I'm almost seventy. And uh, when I was growing up, you get a job in your twenty, settled it, and get a job until you were sixty-five, and then you got the holiday. I think then a generation ago, we weren't going to live quite as long. For a forty-year-old to working on your own. You're used to entrepreneurship, um, and if you don't like what you're doing, you're used to mobility in the employment, the, uh, employment space. So you've got more freedom than we had because of societal pressure on our part. Um, and I try to influence my 30-year-old. You know, like he quit his job again the other day. Well, I got to accept that's just the way it is. You know, it I is, like yeah. I've proven to something else. Yeah. Uh, Move from employment, from working with other people or for other people, totally different for a 40 year old than it is. That's why, you know, I take my hat off to you. Work on your own. You decide what your clients are, you decide what you want to do. Uh, job, even from, from a solicitor to a, a bank manager to a line worker. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I brought that up. It actually made, yeah, now, now makes a whole lot of sense. Um, so back to the the, um, the the presentations that you're that you're going to be doing around Australia, and it sounds like mostly up and down the east coast of Australia. Is is there um, are, are people are, are they are they all for the, the client presentations? But are, are, is there any opportunity for um, anyone else that's not part of those groups to come along? Is there anything that's more more public, or it's all? Yeah, there certainly is. Um, yeah, in in every cent or. Speaking to the general public, all the guys at the public. Um, obviously, they're for the clients of the firm putting it on, but all have agreed to open um, because the message is not selling the firm, it's selling the message. Uh, so I think you'll find in any of the places, and I will put on my website and give it to you for your website Please. on where things are uh, because I'm certainly covering enough of the country stock somebody something somewhere close that uh, your clients can go to yeah so, we'll, we'll get uh, we'll get, I'll get those. Example, it is sponsored by Shatforth. they uh will take your name give you an invite if you contact them hmm. thanks we'll, we'll um i'll get the, we'll get the details from you and put yeah. it in the notes or something somewhere so people can have a look and and the books that you mentioned as well are they on your website is that where, where can uh, people get those if they're interested yep. yeah on my website um uh, I think that so you can get ready re to retire just to clean it up, but uh, it has been very popular around the world, and um, uh, I think both for both advisors and their clients, because I also teach advisors on what to expect in their clients as they get older. Yeah, okay. Nice. All right. Well, thanks, Barry. Thank you for joining me. Pleasure to catch up with you again. Hope your, uh, your, your trip out to Australia and tour around goes well. Uh, thanks, thanks for joining me again. How can it not? <laughs> oh. Thanks, Barry. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs>